Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Sometimes breaking news gives me some of my best opportunities, and this is one of them. Uh, my good friend Chuck Todd uh, sends his regards. As you know, there was news made today. If you haven't heard, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it. The president talking about some changes in the posture of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. So Chuck remained at the White House tonight to report on that. And I have the privilege of being able to spend some time with someone I have covered in the hallways. And as a resident of Virginia, he was my senator uh, for that term as well. So it's nice to see you again, Senator Thank you. Webb. Good to be with you. Good to be with all of you. And thank you for braving the weather, by the way. <laughs> Please do think of some questions during our conversation because we want to bring you into this. And uh, as you were suggested to write them down, please do think in terms of uh, printing them so I can read them easily. If you want to include your name and the town you're from, please feel free to do that as well. I want to talk about your book in part because I think the writer in you is something that uh, people who only know you through your military service or through politics may not realize how prolific a writer you are. And to do a memoir for your 10th book, I find particularly interesting. And I love the lyrical nature of I Heard My Country Calling and the poem that that comes from. Why was this book difficult to write, maybe more difficult than some of the others? It was. It was the hardest book I've ever written, and emotionally the hardest book I've ever written. Um, you know, I uh, have had this unintentional career since I left the, the, the Marine Corps, where I uh, was raised from uh, the time I was very young to lead. You know, everybody has their conversations at the dinner table, and my father, having uh, been uh, in the military and loved the military, uh, the conversations were, how do you motivate people? How do you take care of them? How do you do what you have to do, uh, even, if, uh, even if it uh, is hard, and what is moral courage, and those sorts of things. And then when I uh, left the Marine Corps, my last year in the Marine Corps, I was on a medical hold after I'd been wounded. I was on the Secretary of the Navy staff, and uh, I started writing as, as a part of my job, and I found I loved the written word, the, what Hemingway used to call the chemistry of the written yes. word. And yes. so when I started law school, actually, I, I started writing. I wrote my first book, which was a nonfiction book about our strategic interests in the Pacific, uh, worked out in uh, Guam and the Mariana Islands as a military planner during the, the uh, breaks when I was in law school, and I started writing Fields of Fire. And, um, that book was, uh, you know, I was, writing it, <laughs> it was, I was writing it at a time when uh, everyone wanted to, you know, like get some separation yes. from, uh, from the Vietnam War. But it was, uh, but when it was published, it gave me the opportunity, because it, it, uh, it was a successful book, to become a writer and support myself as a writer. So since that time, I've gone in one world for a while and missed the other. You know, I write for a while and miss leading, and I lead for a while and miss writing, and this was no exception. It was the fourth time I've done a period of government service or public service, and then uh, taken a step back and, and uh, collected my thoughts and written something. And I didn't really want to write one of these tell-all books coming out of the Senate. You know, I, I, Although I would have enjoyed that. I know everybody. I, 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 on the Senate floor, that was the subject of a lot of conversation toward the end of my term. Uh, you know, and, I, and I just said, you're all safe. <laughs> I'm not going to write about that. That's so uh, rare in Washington. There's, uh, you know, there, well, you know, I met with Cap Weinberger every day for four years when he was Secretary of Defense, and you'll never mm -hmm. see a word that was said behind a closed door. I just don't believe that's the way governments should work. And so I was having a discussion with my publisher, and the observation was a little bit similar to what you just said, was that people kind of know what you did in the military, and they certainly you know, know the things we worked on were in the Senate, but they don't really know how you got there. And so I decided to write this early memoir, and it actually ends at the point where I began this unintentional two-track career. So do you define yourself, if you were to boil it down with one word, are you writer, marine, leader? You know, somebody asked me that many years ago when I was in the Pentagon as Assistant Secretary of Defense after I'd, I'd written Fields of Fire and then a, a, a book about the Naval Academy and, and, uh, and then gone into the, uh, the Pentagon. And I, I said, I, I guess it still holds, I, you know, I said, uh, in, my, in my mind, I'm a writer. In my heart, I'm a soldier. And I always will be. Mm, I like that combination. Uh, what I, I was struck by some of the personal nature of, of this, which I'm sure is why it was so difficult to write, to talk about your father and what it was like to experience his deployments, uh, his sort of gruff style, and talking about how sometimes it was harder to spend the time with him when he was home <laughs> than it was to miss him while he was serving. Well, I wrote a, I wrote a 
very emotional scene, uh, emotional for me to write it, about when my dad came back from the Berlin Airlift, and I was a little kid, and, you know, uh, he'd been gone so long, and when I saw him, I couldn't even talk to him. You know, and, you know, I ran, hit under the table, and he came and got under the table with me. He'd been gone for quite a, quite a while. And, by, by the way, how important my grandmother was to our life. And one of the reasons I, I, I like the trajectory of, of this book is it takes you into the post-World War II military and then the Cold War uh, military. And a lot of people forget that until World War II, our country never really kept a large standing military during what we would arguably call peacetime. After every war, including World War II, we demobilized. Um, we did so after World War II, and we didn't uh, join NATO. We didn't help create NATO until 1949, uh, after my father had been there in the Berlin Airlift. Um, and that period uh, was unique in terms of families, military families. And one of the things I'm proudest of in, in, in the time that I've spent in public service is what we've been able to do uh, since that period in terms of getting family assistance into, uh, into the Department of Defense uh, mindset. But when we built this large standing uh, military, there really weren't structures there for, for families in the way that there are now. Um, and so there was one period for three and a half years where my dad was either deployed or on bases where there, weren't, uh, there wasn't military military housing. Um, my mother, when my dad went to the Berlin Airlift, was 24 years old. She had four kids. She was in a town where she hardly knew anyone. And um, family assistance at that point meant that my grandmother moved in to live with us mm -hmm. from the time I was two to the time I was eight. And in, in defense of my dad, my dad was hard and tough, but he was a great inspiration to me. And a great and, teacher. And, you know, some of my memories from, from that age were living in St. Joe, Missouri. And I was just out in St. Louis last uh, last weekend, and uh, my dad uh, was at that time stationed at Scott Air Force Base, uh, and it was 380 miles, and he drove it every weekend. 380 miles one way, wow. no interstates. And yeah, he'd, uh, he'd leave work Friday at 5 o'clock, or drive all night, come in the house about 5 in the morning, raise hell for a day and a half, <laughs> get in the car, and go back, but uh, he was there. It almost is like your father took on a mythic quality within the family because of those absences and that larger-than-life personality and the, the peril and the intrigue of what he was doing professionally. Well, that's why I wrote the other chapters. Because <laughs> <laughs> when he was gone, you know, he was sort of this iconic figure. I took a picture of him in the bed with me every night when he was over there, you know, standing on the runway. And then he got back, and it was like, you know, when you re-enter that family environment, um, my dad and my grandmother really were both very strong, you know, like alpha figures, and but they had a lot of figuring out to do when my dad got back. Sure. But uh, yeah, he was uh, he was a pretty unique guy. And in those days, there obviously wasn't an easy way to be in touch. There weren't phone calls. There, there clearly there. You know, it's long before That's email the, and so forth. So he, when he was gone, he was gone. Yeah, and the same, by the way, um, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. When I was in Vietnam, you know, you we had. Uh, um, you know, you'd write a letter, and you, you'd get, there was airmail by then, but, you know, two weeks later, you'd get the answer. You'd be carrying on an argument with somebody, <laughs> and, you know, the letter come back two weeks later, and you couldn't remember what it was that you'd said in the first place. And uh, we got three, uh, when I was, the, the, during the time I was in Vietnam, we got, uh, there was a program called the Mars Stations. I don't know if people remember that. You know, it was a ham radio operators uh, would, would allow a hookup so that if, when we got back into a rear area, we could go stand in line, and we got a three-minute phone call. Uh, you go stand in this room, and there'd be a Mars operator back home, you know, hooking it up to your family, and you, and you had to say over every time, so they'd switch the fitch ba uh, switch back uh, for the person to talk back to you. So he'd be, "Hey, how you doing? Over, over where? Uh, okay, well, I got to go now." You know, so that was the one real difference when my son was in Iraq, uh, even though he was an infantry guy and was out there, you know, knocking down doors a lot of the time. That you know, you could stay in reasonably good touch through through emails. I remember when uh, when he came home, you know, he uh, I'd been I was in Afghanistan as an embed um, in 04 and, I, and my son was at Penn State uh, and uh, I brought him with me as my photographer that was the deal I made when I went and he he came out of that and he just said, "Why am I in school? Look what these people are doing." And uh, um, after the Battle of Fallujah in 04, he enlisted in the in the in the Marine Corps, but uh, he was over there as an infantry lance corporal and then uh, uh, he got extended on the Bush surge, 
And you can imagine the mood inside these <laughs> rifle companies when you're, you're counting your days, everything's the days, and then all of a sudden you've got two more months, whatever. So I sent him an email uh, at one point. I said, what do you want when you come back? You know, we'll, we'll figure it out. And he says, Red Sox, Yankees, Fenway Park, <laughs> May 19th. And we actually were able to do it. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> well, your father served in the Air Force. And I was struck by how you chose the Navy and the Marine Corps and a story you tell about the power of a mango. <laughs> and this is something, in covering Senator Webb, I certainly never knew about how an exotic fruit could shape the direction of your military career. Well, actually, it, it shaped the interests of my life. I was, uh, we moved so much. Uh, you know, we, we averaged, my, I figured it out in the book, I think we averaged a new house about every eight months when I was growing up. Um, moving inside, we lived in Amarillo, Texas for one year. We moved three times. Uh, we lived in England for two years. We moved three times. And uh, uh, I went to nine schools in five years at one, one point. Uh, and, you know, an, I was in... Uh, uh, Nebraska. My dad had got stationed at, off at Air Force Base in Nebraska, and I was working in the in the base commissary. But I started reading James Michener, and uh, I read Hawaii. And if you can imagine sitting in in uh, the Nebraska. winter of Nebraska <laughs> and reading this magical book, to me still even to this day, the book is magical. And what he was able to do with taking the cultural histories of all these different cultures and intertwine them in in this place. And, I, you know, I, I was saying, I'm going to get there. Somehow, I'm going to get there. And uh, I was at the, the mango thing. Was I, I was at the commissary one day in here in you know, Nebraska and uh, all the way back, back then. I, I looked up on the shelf up on the produce wall, and there was a mango. And I'd read about this in, in Michener's book. And I remember I dropped my entire tip money that day to buy <laughs> this mango. And I brought it home, and I didn't even know how to eat it. You know, I thought it was like an apple. No, nah, it didn't work. Yeah. You know, and I, yeah. Tried to cut through it like, like you would a, an orange, and you know you hit this big seed. But I, you know, I said, "All right, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go there." And um, in when I was in high school, I wanted, I also knew that I wanted to be in the military. I, my, my, my father had really infused us with, with the idea that you know, there's no greater honor than, than stepping forward, and serving your country. But I liked the infantry side. My dad was a pilot. My brother ended up being a pilot in the, in the, in the Marine Corps. And I just didn't get it when they would, you know, they do this. Pilots do this. You know, they always talk with their hands. You <laughs> yes. Know. And uh, so I knew I wanted to be in the infantry side. And at that time, uh, the, the Army did not have a scholarship program, uh, ROTC scholarship program. I could not have gotten in the Naval Academy out of high school. I'd moved so much. I could really do well in standardized tests, but my grades were all over the place. Um, and I saw that the Navy had this ROTC program, a scholarship program, um, and I, uh, I applied for it. And along the way, I fell in love with the Marine Corps. And I, you know, from, I, from the time I was like 17, I wanted to be a Marine. And you were drawn to USC simply because of the weather. <laughs> when I got the scholarship, back then what they would do is uh, they, they had the NROTC program in like 51 colleges. And you listed your top six choices. And then after that, you say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And if they gave you the scholarship, as long as you got into one of those schools, you could have the scholarship. And, yeah, and I was in Omaha, Nebraska, freezing, you know, in the middle of winter. <laughs> and I put down the six warmest schools. I didn't even know where the you know, <laughs> University of Southern California was. So. <laughs> and somehow they, uh, they accepted me. So. And so from USC then to the Naval Academy, right. uh, where you, as I understand it, you just wanted to be 24-7 in that mindset and preparing. You had no choice. <laughs> um, w the time that I was at the Naval Academy was a fascinating time looking back on it in, in, uh, in terms of the, uh, the history of our country. Uh, the, I was in the class of 1968. We arrived um, like less than a week before Lyndon Johnson signed the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And within six weeks, the Gulf of Tonkin incident had occurred, which began the real escalation inside Vietnam. And so for those four years, those, those two issues that were really reverberating, reverberating across the country were, were in, all, constantly intertwining and, and, uh, uh, and pulling the country in some, some pretty difficult directions. Just that last four or five months before, uh, before we graduated, um, the Tet Offensive began in Vietnam. Uh, January, February, March. Lyndon Johnson said he wasn't going to run for re-election. April the 7th, as I recall, Martin Luther King was assassinated. 
uh, only two months before we graduated. The night before we graduated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And, and at the same time, we were living in this world, which is really your 24-7 question. We were in, living in this, in this world where we knew that no matter what was going on the outside, we had undertaken an obligation to lead young Americans in a very difficult war. And the Naval Academy itself during that period was uh, uh, a lot different place than, than it is today. Our class, uh, I think we started with, the, the numbers are in the book, I think we started with 1,350 on the first day and we graduated 821 people. We had the highest attrition rate of any class in, in post-World War II to the end of the Vietnam. And you had some notable yeah. classmates, the people that had, names that people very, would definitely know. It was a very, uh, you know, you don't think of this way. You don't, you know, we went through things together, but you don't, you don't really think of this way except in, in retrospect. But yes. uh, the, the people in, in that class who made it to graduation, there were a lot of good people who did not. Um, but the people who did, uh, I have enormous respect for all of them. And we, we ended up with 23 admirals out of that one class, uh, including uh, two Chiefs of Naval Operations. It's only two other Naval Academy classes in history that have ever done that. Mike Mullen being the, 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 the second one going on to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Yes. Uh, six general officers in the, in the Marine Corps, which at that time I think that's probably never occurred before with the Naval Academy classes. I don't know. Uh, and a commandant of the Marine Corps. And, uh, so, yeah, I mean, we're very talented class, or in, you know, looking back from the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew certainly that if you were in at that time, it was a hot environment, so much like your son knew that when he joined, he would be engaged fully, not like a peacetime. Uh, There's an interesting cadet. thing I talk about in the book. Yes, we knew, particularly on the Marine Corps side, we all knew where we were going. Um, and my my dad, who uh, uh, had worked his way into college uh, education while he was in the military, he, my dad went to night school for 26 years. He was the first one in our family to finish high school from the, of the webs uh, on, on a, well, the southwest Virginia, eastern Kentucky area in the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, one of the great moments in my life, which I write about, was I call it the Great Santini moment, for anybody who remembers the, the movie, The Great Santini, where uh, <clears throat> we went to his graduation in uh, University of Omaha. He was stationed there at the Air Force Base. And uh, I watched him you know, go through the line to get the diploma. And he gets the diploma, and he breaks out of line. He starts walking across the basketball court. And I went, oh, my God, he's not really going to do this. And he did. He walked up to me and stuck it in my face and said, you can get anything you want in this country. Don't you ever forget it. Um, but once he got his college degree, he advanced very quickly in the officer ranks of the, of the uh, Air Force. He became a pioneer. In, he Already was a pioneer in the missile program. But he commanded a missile squadron. And, um, was assigned to the Pentagon while I was at, at the Naval Academy and worked in legislative liaison and became really um, uh, I, I, I'm strongly critical of the McNamara regime in the Pentagon and how they were managing the war without listening to the input of the traditional career leaders in the military. And we tend to forget because of the way the Vietnam War ended. I will say this. Uh, and I will always believe it, the, the military leadership that took us into the Vietnam War was the best military leadership we have ever had in the history of this country. These people had fought World War II. They had fought Korea. They had studied you know, the, the, the true principles of leadership. Uh, and they were kind of being brushed away. And my dad became very concerned that I wanted to be a Marine. He was looking at what was happening on the battlefield. We forget. Through 1967 through 69, we were losing more than a general, more than a thousand people dead every month. We we lost more people in 1969 when, when I was in Vietnam. We lost twice as many as we've lost in Iraq and Afghanistan combined during the entire war in that one, in, that, in that one year. And you know, it became he was a professional, um, but it came became very personal to him. He just didn't want me to do it. He kept his his mantra was. Go in the Navy, stay on the ship, eat ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we really had our debates. And then, uh, you know, I went in, he really, it really upset him. And then my brother went in. And by the time my brother went in, it was like I served 26 years in the Air Force and I gave the Marine Corps both my sons. <laughs> but it was. 
pretty And you, you know, learned pretty what, what that pressure was when your own son was... I did. Yes. I, I've, I've often said, I, I know what it's like to have my father deployed. I know what it's like to be deployed. But it's, I've never the had it as pressure. hard as when I was a father with my son deployed, yes. emotionally. Yes. And, and I honestly believe that if 25% of the United States Congress had to wake up every morning wondering if their kid was alive, you'd have a different mm -hmm. foreign policy right now. And do you think that speaks to the difference between an all-volunteer army versus a time when there was a draft? Does that you know, change here's, how here's you the feel difference. about it? Here's the difference. And, you know, you've covered the military. You see, you see these people out there. The difference really is not so much in the people who are drawn, particularly the combat units. The difference is the feeling of vulnerability in the country. You know, um, when I was doing the GI Bill, and I'm very proud of the fact that we got that through. I introduced the GI Bill my first day in office. I actually wrote it with legislative counsel before I was sworn, in, sworn into, the, into the Senate. Um, I was trying to get the data from the Pentagon in terms of what percentage of our military really still is citizen soldier, even though it's an all-volunteer military. And I'm a data guy. I spent five years in the Pentagon. And when you work with the Pentagon, the question you ask governs the answer you receive. You know, they're very good, I will say this, they're very good <laughs> at steering the answer, you know, in a way that what they believe protects their, their self-interest. And it took me a year to get the answer to this question. I finally got it. The question was, what percentage of our military leaves the military on or before the end of their first enlistment? Hmm. Because we tend to think, because it's an all-volunteer system, it's an all-career system, and it's not. The answer that came back is probably the, 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 the economy now probably has altered these figures somewhat, but probably not by much. The answer was 75% of the people who go in the Army, 70% of those who go into the Marine Corps, and more than half of those who go into the Navy and the Air Force uh, leave on or before the end of their first enlistment. And that's healthy for the country. We are citizen soldiery. Um, but it's, uh, and it's not really that different really from, from Vietnam. The difference is since it's volunteer, and in the Marine Corps, as I say, they're a double volunteer. You volunteer to go in the, in the Marine Corps, and then you volunteer again for your MOS, if you can qualify for it, your occupational specialty. The difference is there's no, you know, there's, there's no one out there um, other than this, the, this small group and their families who have to wake up and think about it. There are only two World War II veterans still in the United States Congress. Uh, John Dingell and Ralph Hall. And Dingell's retiring, and Ralph Hall is, as we speak, up in a runoff in Texas, representing Texas 4. I just covered him, which is why it's familiar. There is a smaller and smaller class of Vietnam veterans, but there are veterans of the more recent wars that are putting themselves forward as candidates that are serving now. Do you think that will uh, give that sort of, it's not the parent experience that you were just talking about, but to have again another time when people with real combat experience are serving in Congress. It's always helpful, you know, and the, the motivation behind the GI Bill that I introduced was to do two things. One, to provide these citizen soldiers the ability to have a strong transition back into civilian life. The people who just step forward and say, all right, I want to I want to serve my country. If I want to enlist, I want to go over there and do a couple pumps, you know, and then and then then I want to go and do other things. We were calling them the Xbox generation, the the enlisted, the people who enlist because mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have the education and they really weren't plugging back in. So, and the and the second was to hopefully broaden the spectrum of of people who would come into the military to to more accurately match you know, our, our society writ large. When you know the GI Bill that we passed, is, it's, the, it's a, a mirror of the World War II GI Bill, except it's a little better, actually. But it's pay your tuition, buy your books, give you a monthly stipend, empower your future. So I want to see great things come from the people who've used that, that GI Bill. When you look at uh, the decision the president made today about uh, how the U.S. will change from the roughly 30,000 troops that are in Afghanistan now to 9,800 by the end of 2015. And that is contingent on the new leader of Afghanistan 
signing the agreement permitting U.S. forces there because Hamid Karzai says he will not sign it. Is that the right strategy to telegraph the timeline and the deceleration in your judgment? Um, I haven't seen the, all the mechanics of, of what uh, the president was saying. Um, but in general, here's, here's my concern. I've had it for a long time. People talk about this so-called pivot toward Asia. I was a big part of this. I've spent a lot of time in Asia in my life, uh, all, th all through my life. I had the uh, East Asia Subcommittee on the Foreign Relations Committee when I was in the, in the uh, Senate. Um, I think if there's been a pivot, it's a pivot into that part of the world. And I was strongly um, critical of the, uh, the decision to go into Iraq. I just thought it was, I, I don't believe we belong as an occupying power in that part of the world. I don't think it helps us. There are ways to, to uh, uh, protect our national interests without having put so many people on the, on the ground over there. Um, and in Afghanistan, I was there as a, an embed in, in 04. I we probably had about 10 to 15,000 Americans over there in 04. I mean, if he's, if so he's going down to that number. number. But the question is, you know, how you uh, communicate and protect your national interests and what you do with your military. And, and I think that uh, we made a big mistake. We, we had the greatest maneuver forces in the world. We, we get trained up, we probably still will again. And we put them, you know, block by block, street by street, uh, you know, in these cities in Iraq, and we ended up doing the same thing in Afghanistan. So I don't have any problem with reducing the, uh, the size of the military in that part of the world. What we really need to do is to uh, get a clear statement of what our national interests are, and we're not seeing that these days, and then build a future military around that. When you talk about your commitment to Asia, you have spent a big part of your career focused there, and you spent time in Myanmar, Burma, it was once known as, before it was sort of cool to do that uh, in terms of uh, some of the attention that that's uh, gotten. And there have been changes there. And uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has been released and she came to the U.S. Capitol. And there's, there's a real emotional story there. And at the time that Secretary Clinton was serving, she also had the opportunity to make that a part of her legacy. Do you think she deserves credit for the work on Myanmar as a part of her record as Secretary of State? Well, let me say this. Um, in terms of that part of the world, I, as you said, I've, I've been around, I've uh, got a very strong attachment to it. I've spent a good bit of time over there as a journalist, as a business person, as a, uh, in, in the military and in government. I, uh, spent a good bit of time as a journalist in Japan doing different things, in the Philippines, um, uh, Vietnam. I've, I've, I've gone back to Vietnam. Uh, just I've been in Vietnam just about every year except maybe two or three since 1991. I've watched the, the changes and I remain hopeful for, for more changes in Vietnam. Uh, Thailand, spent a lot of time there. Um, and most of the other ASEAN countries I've, I've, I've been in. Um, and with respect to Burma, uh, I was there in 01 um, with the freedom of being an ordinary <laughs> citizen walking around. I had I'd written a piece for the Wall Street Journal about, um, it was called, they, they titled it, The Struggle for Mastery in Asia, and it was about the emergence of China uh, and how we need to stay connected for all these economic, um, strategic, cultural reasons. And uh, I was saying, when you're not there, when you're not there, you know, the, 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 the gradualism of, of uh, the, the emergence of Chinese military power and, you know, in a proper sense, their economic growth is going to change the relationships in the region. And uh, there was an American who uh, had, I think, probably the finest outdoor furniture company in the world in, in Burma um, who sent me a letter. And he said, if you want to see what happens, when the United States withdraws its interest from an, air, from an area and the, and the Chinese move in, come and visit me in Burma, because he was facing the sanctions that were coming down um, in, in uh, eventually became full-blown in 2003. He had, to, he had to pull his company out. And so I was on my way 
into that part of the world anyway. I went over and spent eight days with him and just bouncing around. He took me to all these different places. And it was, it was very clear that we needed a different formula uh, over there. And I talked about it for years uh, when Secretary Clinton was uh, selected to be Secretary of State. I spent a couple hours with her one day, put a map of Asia on the wall, and talked her through all my views in that part of the world. Pushed very hard. Um, in, in terms of changing the formula. What I actually said when I came to the Senate was, here's, here's where we're going to focus our office, you know, even separate from the, the Foreign Relations Committee. Invigorate our relations in Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, and change the formula in Burma. And so we carried the load, I will say without hesitation, we carried the load on transforming that relationship. When I went in in 2009, uh, we spent seven months uh, getting the clearances to go in there. We did it not just through the State Department. They, uh, I'm not sure they were totally sold on this idea at the time, but through validators like Chris Kingsley, my friend who had had the business there, and, and others. Um, um, and I was the first American leader uh, in 10 years to visit Burma. I was the only American leader who ever met with the uh, head of their uh, military junta, Tan Shui, the only one he ever met with. I met with Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, actually, there was an American named John Yetaw who had been imprisoned in, in, in Burma by trying to save Aung San Suu Kyi. I'm not sure oh. if you remember that. I had <laughs> made some homemade wooden fins to swim in the lake uh, to go try to rescue her from her house or whatever, and of course he got caught. And, uh, and we were having the discussions with the Burmese government. They were saying, um, we have Mr. Yeta. We're going to put him in prison. We, they didn't quite know what to do with him. And uh, I said, why don't I just take him out? Why don't I, just, I have room on my plane. Why don't I take him out? So I took Yeta out on that trip. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was an interesting Sometimes plane Sometimes a simple solution, they, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, he, uh, so circling back. So I would say we laid the pipe. Yes. We definitely okay. laid the pipe. Okay. And yeah. so if Secretary Clinton gets some of the credit for the outcome, you think that she was lifted by the work that you were doing years before? You have to ask her. Okay. <laughs> In talking about uh, how you have moved from writer to public life, back to writer, public life to journalist, you've written a book, you're in the writer phase, so what about the next public life phase? We're, we're doing some hard thinking about that. You know, my, my wife, Hung, and I, we've talked about it quite a bit because when I left the Senate, I, I think I probably puzzled a lot of people because I, yeah. I just made a statement saying, I'm not going to do any interviews. I'm a you know, regular visitor on a lot of these shows. I'm not going to do any op-eds. You, know, you went dark for a while. Totally, totally. And, and, uh, and I'm not, and I, for until... I finished the book. I just wanted to create a separation, get my mind straight. So it's a separation it's, from uh, you know a separation from um, the public service side of my life, which is I, which is what I've done several different times, and going all the way back to the uh, when uh, President Reagan was elected. I was a committee counsel in the Congress. I was invited to interview for a position in their administration, and I just said, you know, I've spent four years on the Veterans Committee, uh, um, and I wanted to go back and write. I wrote a book, did journalism. I was in Beirut as a, as a TV correspondent. Uh, and after the building blew up in Beirut uh, in October 83, I just said, I need to put my oar back in the water. Uh, but this has been a natural process for me. And yeah, we're, we're ready to come back in and start talking about issues again. So there are two potential tracks that I could see that going. One is a short-term, unexpected track, and that has to do with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And an argument could be made that Eric Shinseki will need to step aside. And I could see the president saying, Jim Webb, please answer your country's call again. Would you serve as the VA chief, even for the limited time left? I really don't have any desire to be a member of the cabinet. Um, and, at the, and, and, and I don't want to presuppose that something's going to happen to General Shinseki either. I think that the VA really needs more, uh, more activist leadership to sol solve these problems. I've, s I've been saying that for, for years. When I uh, 
came to the Senate. I was on the Veterans Committee. You know, with a lot of these issues, uh, the, the basic issues that I'd been mentored by the World War II people on when I was a young counsel on the, on the House side, and I could not believe that we had a 600,000 case backlog in terms of the veterans trying to get adjudication of their, their cases. But when I left the Senate, it was 900,000. Now, if you've, if you've got that kind of a problem and you're a leader, you're going to put your good leaders on the problem and, and, and work to fix the problem. And um, I hope they do that, but, you know. You would not take the president's call if he asked that question? I'll always take the president's call, but I don't have any <laughs> desire to do that job. <laughs> do you think that uh, Secretary Shinseki, four-star general, should step aside? I, that's between him and the president. The other potential track is one that involves the numbers 2016, and what will the Democratic Party be looking for in a potential leader? There's a lot of discussion about Hillary Clinton, uh, and there's a room, there, there are many who say there's room in the party for other voices. And when I think back to when you did the State of the Union response during President Bush's term, and you were giving the response for the Democratic Party, you spoke about what would now be, you know, referred to as kind of the in view of democratic progressives of economic populism. You talked about the minimum wage. You talked about uh, the middle class not having a seat at the table in 2007. Those ideas seem to be uh, something the Democrats are looking for again. Is 2016 and a presidential run something you're actively considering? We're just taking it a day at a time. There are a lot of ways for me to begin contributing again. But I will say this. You know, in, in terms of what we did in, in the Senate, um, there is an, like an overarching paralysis because of how both parties have kind of retreated into their, into their bases. But even given that, we did a lot of good. And, and uh, I started talking about economic fairness on the campaign trail when I, when I first decided to run. That, uh, the, uh, the true test of the Democratic Party over the years has been whether they will provide a voice to people who have no power in the quarters of power. Um, I talked about social justice. When I uh, was running, I started talking about our totally broken criminal justice system. And I had Democratic Party advisors come up and say, in Virginia, you're committing political suicide if you talk about this. But everywhere I would go, people would start nodding. This is a broken system. And not, you know, it's not political. This is a leadership question. And when I came to the uh, Senate, I wasn't on the judici Judiciary Committee, um, but from our own office, we started working on this problem. And I was on the uh, Joint Economic Committee, which isn't a legislative <laughs> committee, but you can do oversight on anything that you can put an economic label on. So um, I said, well, how about I do a hearing on the economic consequences of mass incarceration? Okay, uh, how about we do a hearing on the economic dynamic of drugs policy from point of origin to uh, the number of people who become imprisoned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we brought that issue out of the shadows. Uh, I, I uh, worked with my staff to create a piece of legislation, a very simple piece of legislation, $14 million, one helicopter, for a year and a half commission to get the best minds in America together to just study uh, what we need to do in our criminal justice system from point of apprehension to point of return. Um, we eventually got the buy-in of the entire philosophical spectrum on this. Uh, we did the Asia thing we're talking about. So we, you know, under the umbrella of having to, you know, to endure the paralysis, we did a lot of good. Day by day is what I heard. So you're considering the possibility <laughs> day by day. No, no, no. What I said was we're taking it a day at a time. So. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I've been out. So you I'm don't rule back. it out. Do you think the party needs to have a lively primary process? I think the Democratic Party needs a strong debate about the future of the country, and it is very clear in terms of the dislocation in our society from the uh, people at the very top and even the middle class. When I was running, I was saying, this isn't two Americas. It's three Americas, and we have to get this fixed. But we, we need to have a lively debate, whether it's in a primary or not. No. And one more question on this, because this I find very interesting. Uh, so you, you are about like a year or so older than Secretary Clinton and a little bit younger than Joe Biden. 
Is age a factor at all in how you would evaluate running for president? I think everybody has to make up their own mind about that, but I think what people are looking for is, are fresh ideas, good ideas. Uh, can you art articulate a vision for where the country needs to go domestically and in foreign policy um, and those, those sorts of things? Okay. Well, I'm intrigued because I think there's a lot of open doors in what Senator Webb had to say. So I'm loving that. I feel my work is done. So let's see what you have on your minds here for the audience Q&A. Um, let me see if I can, what I can. Uh, okay. Oh, did I drop some? Okay. Oh, very good. Oh, and they're in print, so that's easier. Um, what can we do to reduce the corporate uh, bu bureaucrats that have bloated the official core of our military? Officer corps. Officer corps. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I take it. You must be John. Yes. Um, can you speak to that, sir? Are there too many, too many officers? Is that your concern? The, uh, I, you know, actually, I do the prefer when. You know, resemble a large bloated corporation with levels and levels and levels. We have well known during the Vietnam era, there were like four times as many generals as there were during World War II. So it's gotten very bureaucratic. Well, I think what, I, here's a, 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 a way that I, I think I can help address that. Um, we got way too many headquarter staffs, or people on our headquarter staffs, and there's no question about that. Um, Part of this has been the creation of all these different independent commands where before the Goldwater-Nichols legislation in the, in the 1980s, um, there were clear, clear lines of command out of the individual services through the Joint Chiefs. And we, we, and we, and you create CENTCOM and you know, all com these different and comms. Yes. And, and then they get their own budget. And then they get their own staffs. Uh, and you could really see it in... Uh, in the office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, where when Jim, James Forrestal became the first Secretary of Defense, I think he had maybe two assistant secretaries. Uh, and um, I pushed really hard when I was in the Senate uh, to, for an examination of the number of flag officers in all the services and for them to justify it. Um, very inter had a very interesting hearing. I was a chairman of the personnel subcommittee and, uh, um, you know, there was pretty, you know. Pushback, I would Yes, imagine. there was, uh, you yeah. know, particularly from the Air Force, by the way. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> growing up in the Air Force, so that, you know, the Air Force had, had so many general officers, particularly Brigadier General. Um, but we have a situation now in the, in the United States Navy, quite frankly. When I was commissioned in 1968, there were 930 combatants in the United States Navy. Uh, when I was Secretary of the Navy, it had gone down to 479 after Vietnam got up. We tried to get it up to 600. But you've got about 280 now. I write in the book. I think we, we've reached a situation where we have more admirals than we do ships in the United States mm. Navy. Um, so, I mean, there's definite, you know, definite, definite room to cut back the staffs. That's the, the, that's the way to start going. To, and to look at the justification for the, for the flag, uh, flag ranks. Um, and would that be Chuck just Hagel, a cost uh, savings, or do you think it would create, create oh, I a think better result as well? Trickle down. And, and, you know, it's, uh, Chuck Hagel said that, they were going to start reducing the size of the different uh, offices, uh, staffs, but I think he put 2019 or something as the, as the date on this. So you kind of get the headline, we're going to reduce the staffs, but it's going to happen after we're all gone. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, they, they, could re they could really do that and not affect um, the operational performance and the people on the other end. And I'll say one other thing on this, because people need to think about this. Uh, there was a, a proposal earlier this year um, in shaping the DOD budget that uh, they would reduce the retirement pay of the young retirees, you know, the, the people who do their 20 years. Uh, and and uh, I was kind of stunned. This is one of the things about mm -hmm. not being able to talk mm -hmm. when I declared, you know, this wall. <laughs> you know. I was stunned to see these general officers who, if you're a four-star general, you get a retirement, about $232,000 a year, a retirement. Uh, plus, you know, you're going to go on boards and all this stuff. Turn around and say, some gunnery sergeant who did four tours uh, should give up part of his, his retirement in order to balance the DOD, or bring the DOD budget in there. That's not right. 
Here's a question we didn't touch on in our conversation. And what effect did the Vietnam era war protesters have on you at that time? You know, really, I, uh, the th thing I have to say about combat, even in 1969, uh, when you know, the war peaked in 1968, uh, 1969 was the second worst year for casualties, 1967 almost about the same. Uh, but the mood in the country clearly, clearly changed. Uh, infantry combat is the most apolitical environment I have ever been in. You know, people didn't sit around and say, why are we done? I don't think they did on Iwo Jima either. You know, it's a, you talk about more about what you've got to do and when you want to go home and, and how you take care of your, you know, the people who are, who are with you. So you kept the world um, outside, I, outside. It just it wasn't really relevant. We you know, kind of knew people were doing that, but it wasn't relevant to what, to what we were doing. Going from the Marine Corps into law school was totally different. I went to Georgetown Law School, and, and there were very few Vietnam veterans there, and the attitudes were the other way around. And that actually was one of the reasons that I ended up writing Fields of Fire, and I kind of mentioned it in a book. Uh, I, when when uh, W.H. Auden wrote this uh, elegy to... Uh, William Butler Yeats, when he died, he had a phrase in there, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. You know, I mean, was, so there was, seeing the other side of it after I left the Marine Corps had a strong effect. But you know, for me, also, um, the Vietnam War, I, I, the political aspects of the Vietnam War were, were not the forefront of my mind when I went into the Marine Corps. It was doing the job that we were supposed to do, et cetera. And I used to say, well, we'll figure it out at some point. And, there was a turning point for me, um, and that was when South Vietnam fell in, in 1975. Um, you know, whatever one's views were about how we fought the war and, and whether we should have, um, when you'd look on TV and see hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese jumping into the sea, the first diaspora in 2,000 years, no matter all the conflicts you know, they called Vietnam the Ireland of Asia. You know, they had, when the French were there, they had a rebellion every two years. You know. uh, but, you know, my, my wife's family, her entire extended family, um, in, you know, when the, when the country fell, their father was a fisherman. They all got on a boat. Uh, they spent three days at sea not knowing whether they were going to live or die. Uh, finally, the United States Navy scooped them up, brought them to a refugee camp on Guam. And, you know, 1975, remember... People weren't exactly happy to see these Vietnamese coming, coming here. Uh, I can remember many incidents, uh, uh, people being very conflicted. Um, I started working with the Vietnamese community in the late 70s, early, early 80s, and I, I learned another, another side of this. That, and I, I've come to the conclusion with respect to the war itself that the people who fought against us um, believed, uh, Ho Chi Minh used to say, Dok Lap Tu Tso. Uh, independence, freedom. The people who fought against us, I can see they justified their beliefs because they were looking at you know national independence and here we were. But the people who fought with us were were equally justified in my view, looking at the political system that you know they hoped someday would would come into to play. And I want to say this because I'm in Philadelphia. There's another part of this, and that was when the communists took over. People don't are not taught this in schools. We have a 16 year old. She just studied Vietnam. Not a word of this. When the communists took over, they put a million of the best leaders of South Vietnam into re-education camps. And 240,000 of them stayed longer than four years. And I have a friend, a great friend, who was one of the finest soldiers in the South Vietnamese military, I mean, Le Cao, or here, Cao Le, who, after having fought 12 years on the battlefield, um, was imprisoned for 13 years inside his own country. And... Uh, he, could, he was, truly could have been the leader of the Vietnamese military if, if, the, South, if the South Vietnamese military had survived. He came here. He finally migrated with his family to, the, to Philadelphia uh, in 1990. Um, and when he got here, uh, the city of Philadelphia took a risk with him, quite frankly. Um, but I, I, I was a reference. I was you know, trying to encourage them to take a look at him, and they were saying, there, were, there, there was a job that opened up as a liaison to the Asian communities here in, in, in Philadelphia, and the call I got was, wait a minute, this guy spent his entire life either in the military or in prison. How do we know that he can empathetically reach out to the communities? I said, give him a try. And he, he ended up having a wonderful career here, got all kinds of community awards. His two sons 
or the only this is the only time I think in the history of the Philadelphia public schools where they they graduated value, valedictorian and salutatorian in the same class. Um, and he just called me. He's now living down for retired. Down he just called me last week where uh, he just attended the. Uh, graduation of his daughter from Johns Hopkins. Oh, so here, there's the American dream for That you. is truly the American yeah. dream. It's wonderful. Um, how do you explain the extreme polarity in Congress, which unfortunately extends to the Supreme Court? And, you know, we, you were a member of the body, I covered the body. We see that um, tension and people say sometimes it's the worst that it's been in the modern era. Why do you think it is the way it is? Frustration with, with not having a clear articulation of what, what we stand for domestically and foreign policy and money, both of them. Um, you know, I go back to, I'm a Democrat, I go back to Ronald Reagan when he came in. When, when Jimmy Carter was president, people were saying that no one person could be president again. The country would to become too complex to be governable. And, and Reagan came in, and whether people agreed with what he did or not, he was a leader, and he brought strong people around him, and you know, they were they they got things done. And people, he was he was positive. He was talking about who we are and what we're doing. That's a big part of it. But and the other is, quite frankly, you saw what happened um, with, uh, you know, I think it was it was probably an error uh, for President Obama to have moved the uh, health care legislation at the time that he did, and with the the massive size of the program it, would, it 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 made sense before the the economic recession to be talking about it uh but the country had gone you know really in, into deep trouble economically and then we spent an entire year uh arguing and debating this and it just energized people who uh really were opposed to a lot of a lot of other things too and you saw that in the tens, the ten elections, mm -hmm. which is you know what, what you're seeing now. But it now. would have perhaps never been passed if he had not done it when he had a supermajority. It, I voted for this. Um, at the same time, I went into the White House and in, in June and basically said, "This, this is too much. You know, this is going to be." You know, I, voted with the, a, a I, I voted with the Republicans 18 times, trying to narrow the focus. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and if you, if I think you could have done a smaller package and and uh, got it through, or put it at another time. I don't think, uh, you know, the the supermajority by itself um, is is the way to get some of the stuff done. Orrin Hatch, I I, I, may, I think made a great floor speech during the debate, basically saying if we're going to do something this large, we ought to have 70 votes. And he would talk about how often he had worked with Ted Kennedy on on these, you know, controversial pieces. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. I mean, I looked at that. I'll tell you how I looked at it. My mother grew up in East Arkansas. I write about this in the, in the book. And, and uh, uh, she was one of eight children. Um, three of them died in childhood. Not childbirth, childhood. The, the, the sister immediately below her died of typhoid fever. When's the last time somebody died of typhoid fever in this country? Her father died uh, because they didn't have access to a, to, to a doctor. And, and uh, uh, at that time, if you look back in the 1930s, um, there were a lot of people saying the Social Security system shouldn't happen, and uh, you know, in the 1960s, Medicare shouldn't happen. So, we needed to do something for the people who didn't have, don't have access to, to medical care. So, you know, when you when these things come up in the Senate, it's different than the House. Yes. You know, as a committee counsel in the House, I used to put 25 bills a year through the House floor. You, know, you can have these single bullets or rifle shots, they call. Them. Um, the Senate, because of the procedural rules, it's so hard to get something on the floor. Yes. You get these massive legislative packets, and so, you know. Intended to be that way so that it's not sort of the... Kind of, yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I accept that. The um, let's see. Some of these are things we've touched on. Uh, here's one. Uh, why didn't you remain in the Senate? I expected your name to be in the presidential uh, conversation by now. Well, I've tried to get it in there. <laughs> in, I, was, I was struck by it, again, because I'm a resident of Virginia. So uh -huh. uh, when uh, you made your decision, I knew that that was uh, uh, something that would be... It was, in some ways, a surprise, and in other ways, following you day to day, you didn't always seem to love the job. I think you liked some of the things you've talked about here, especially through committee work, which many people, I think, don't realize is one of the things members of Congress 
feel they I had the people, greatest effect. I think people on. underestimate how much I like the job. To tell you the I truth. think I think um, you played it close. You know, I. <laughs> <laughs> I was struck when I read in the book how you talked about your last visit to your office right. in the Russell Senate Office Building, which happens to be where we broadcast from. So I spent a lot of time there, uh, and. You were wistful about it in, in many ways. And you talked about the splendor of the building, which when you go to work there every day, I'm always struck by how people spend their own time from around the country and around the world to come and visit and see it. So I'm very much in tune with how important it is to be respectful of the space and the history of the space. Hearing you describe it uh, did surprise me a little bit because you chose to do only one term. And why didn't you stay longer? Well, let's start with the reality that when people say only one term in a Senate, that's <laughs> the equivalent of three terms in the House and a term and a half as a president. You know, it's six years. And uh, um, my, you know, the, my unwitting pattern has been to come in and serve for a while and then mm -hmm. to take a step back and do some other things. But it was a close call. I mean, all the, you know, all the, the signs toward re-election were positive, uh, and I did really like the ability, I, I guess, for, for lack of a better term, to multiply my brain. You know, I mean, you get a, we had great staff. I spent, you know, that's one of the things I pointed out at the beginning. We, we were very careful to, uh, to pick people that, and we wanted to empower them in the future. So I could have a, I could get 10, I, ten things going and we're, you know, by myself. Exactly. Um, but uh, uh, Hung, my wife, came in. I, I set a deadline because I knew that if I wasn't going to run that I had to, Quite give frankly, give, give Tim Kaine the chance to set up a campaign. Yes. Um, so I just set my birthday as uh, February the 9th as, as the, the drop dead. You know, we, we were going to decide by then. And Hung came in on the 8th, and then we, we got in the car and drove around and just talked, talk, talk about this. And I finally just said, you know, uh, unless I wanted to stay, you know, in a full, you know, career like John Warner, who I uh, have great admiration for him as a, as a statesman and a... Uh, unless I want to do that, then we should just do the same thing that's happened other, other times. And ha have you had the, the wince ever in the time since to wishing you were there or a speech you wanted to make? Or have <laughs> you just been too busy? There's been, well, there have been a lot of issues I, I, you know, I felt like I wanted to talk about. But, you know, I, you know, I spent five years in the Pentagon. I probably haven't been back in that building ten times since I left. I've been back to the Senate one time. Um, since, since I left. I keep up my friendships and, uh, um, you know, and those sorts of things. But, you, you know, you look back with appreciation, but look forward into what you want to do. Very good. Well, we have burned through a lot of time. Oh. And so I apologize to those of you who were generous enough to write a question. We didn't get to them in the amount of time we have here. But I know Senator Webb is going to meet with you and sign books, and you'll have a chance maybe to ask that question personally. So apologies if we didn't get to the topic that you were interested in. But well, I so enjoyed this. Well, thank you, by this. the way, for, for coming up. When the My great pleasure. It's great to see great you. To and I you. think yeah. uh, it's been... Um, it's been a joy to read the book, and I'm intrigued, and I will be curious to follow up with you about what may come next. So thank you, thank Senator you. Webb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.